We last visited Egypt in around 2500 BCE, the height of the Old Kingdom's fourth dynasty and the three great pyramid pharaohs, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkera. I hope you've fastened your time machine seatbelts because now we are jumping forward about 1,000 years. I'm skipping over civil war, invasions, an entire set of very successful dynasties, the Middle Kingdom, and still more invasions. Sorry about that. We are landing in the New Kingdom. Make sure your seats are upright and your tray tables are in locked position. So just how new is the New Kingdom anyway? If we look at a series of pharaoh statues moving from Menkor and Queen, 2490 BCE, to King Tut's inner coffin, 1323 BCE, it doesn't look as if much has changed in Egyptian art or culture over 1200 years. And there's a lot of truth to that. The pharaoh remains an all-powerful ruler, semi-divine, responsible for maintaining Maat and securing the safety and prosperity of the kingdom. But New Kingdom Egypt is at least somewhat new. The map on the left shows Old Kingdom Egypt, really just a narrow strip of land on either side of the Nile. As the map on the right indicates, in the New Kingdom, Egypt became an imperial power. This meant that Egyptian pharaohs had to impose their authority not only on Egyptians, but also on the people they conquered. So this isn't a required work, but note that Ramses II, probably the most powerful New Kingdom pharaoh, built this temple to himself down at the border with Nubia, today Sudan. Think maybe he was trying to make an impression on some newly conquered people? All four of these statues, by the way, portray Ramses himself. You'll note that Ramses is decked out pretty much like all other pharaohs we've studied, but the choice to glorify himself with a temple rather than a pyramid is typical of the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom also brought some changes in the concept of the pharaoh and his depiction in art. During the Old Kingdom, the pharaoh ruled as the son of the god, the incarnation of Horus, son of Osiris. During the New Kingdom, the pharaoh featured increasingly as the chosen representative of the gods, the intermediary between the Egyptian people and the gods. Much of the art from this period shows the king being embraced or touched by the gods, making offerings, and receiving symbols of divine support. Here you see a bas-relief sculpture from an Egyptian temple. The New Kingdom, Pharaoh Seti is making offerings to Amun. As you can see from this diagram, temples had always been part of a pyramid complex, but pharaohs stopped building pyramids after the Old Kingdom fell. There are many theories about why this happened. Pyramid tubes were constantly being robbed, so the pharaohs started digging secret tombs deep in the hills, away from temples where they were now, the now deified pharaoh was worshipped. The human and financial cost of building the pyramids put pharaohs deeply in debt and may have helped bring down the old kingdom. But then, temples we're about to see didn't come cheap either. New Kingdom temples fall into two general categories, temples to gods and temples to pharaohs, and we have an example of each. That's a little misleading, however, since temples to pharaohs, like the temple at Abu Simbel that you just saw, always included rooms devoted to the gods, especially the chief god of the New Kingdom, Amun-Re. When the founder of the 18th dynasty expelled the Hyksos invaders, his hometown, Thebes, became the most important city in Egypt. Thebes' patron deity was Amun, whose identity merged with the sun god Re, already worshipped throughout much of Egypt. The pharaohs of the new dynasty attributed their many military victories to Amun, and they lavished much of the loot they captured on temples to this god. The temple at Karnak is the largest of these. Indeed, it is the second largest ancient religious site in the world after Angkor Wat Temple of Cambodia. Stay tuned for Unit 4. Your readings gave you a lot of information about this famous site and introduced some very important vocabulary. Let's quickly review. What is circled in red? That is a pylon gate. Note the two slanting sides. They represented two mountains between which, according to the Egyptian religion, the sun rose and set. They also represented the horizon. And the green circle? That's a bird's eye view of the hypostyle hall, really a forest of columns. So let's watch the first of several short video clips from a documentary on this temple. The entire video in three parts is up on Canvas, and I highly recommend it, although it probably deserves an R rating. Why do I say that? Watch it and find out. For now, we're just making a flyover. 
The temple at Karnak actually had a series of pylon gates built over time. Construction of this temple began in the Middle Kingdom and continued through to the Greek Ptolemaic dynasties. That included Cleopatra, who hung out with Julius Caesar at the very end of the period we call BCE. More than 30 pharaohs added buildings or rooms to this temple, and sticking on a few more pylon gates was a favorite form of remodeling. So what purpose did these pylons serve? What was their function and their meaning? Well, they weren't holding anything up the way bridge pylons do. Instead, they were designed to impress, if not overwhelm. Anyone entering these gates was entering the precincts of the gods, and most people could not enter between the gates. The temple was a sacred precinct, the actual house of the gods. So the pylons were a kind of barrier between the daily world of people and the eternal world of the gods and the pharaohs. This plan, a required work, shows the additions made by different pharaohs. You don't have to memorize these, but make sure you can read the plan. After going through the pylon gates, the worshiper would enter a large courtyard and from there would move into the hypostyle hall. All those dots in the center left of the plan represent columns in this and other floor plans we'll see. This is an axial plan. What that means is an entrance to succeeding rooms is straight along a horizontal axis down the center. The college board's required image of the hypostyle hall on the upper left doesn't really give you a good sense of just how vast this forest of columns really is, so I've included a panoramic shot. Note how small the people are in comparison with the columns. The columns were elaborately carved in sunken relief, a form of sculpture that created deep shadows and had the additional virtue that it did not disguise the basic shape of the columns. You see two examples of sunken relief on the left, on top, Ramses II making offerings to Amun Re. On the bottom, Seti I smiting some Libyans. Note that the two justifications for the Pharaoh's rule haven't changed since the Palad of Narmer. The Pharaoh assures that Egypt enjoys the protection of the gods and the Pharaoh wins wars. There were many raised relief sculptures at, sculptures at Karnak as well. On the upper right, you see Seti I offering an ointment jar to a god. The images are somewhat misleading, however, as these relief sculptures would have been brightly painted, as the model indicates. The photo on the left also shows the hugely important architectural innovation that first appeared in New Kingdom Egyptian temples, high clerestory windows that let in light. That turn shows up on the AP test all the time, know it. Hypostyle halls were actually intended to represent a marsh back at the beginning of time, that is, a primordial marsh. The columns were meant to resemble papyrus plants. In the dark corners, the columns look like papyrus plants with closed flowers. In the center, where the light shone in, the columns look like papyrus plants blooming in the sun. It's important to understand that ancient Egyptian temples were seen as the place where gods actually resided on earth. In fact, the term Egyptians most commonly used to describe the temple building means mansion or enclosure of a god. So it's no surprise, really, that only the priests and the pharaoh were allowed to enter the hypostyle hall. Remember that exclusivity is one of the characteristics of many sacred spaces. The sanctuary was the most special and important part of the temple. It was a very dark and mysterious place. Only the high priests and the pharaoh could ever enter this sanctuary. In the middle of the sanctuary stood the shrine where the statue of the god or goddess resided. The ancient Egyptians believed that sometimes during rituals the god or goddess would actually enter into the statue. When the pharaoh wasn't available to conduct the daily rituals, which was most of the time, the high priest would ritually clean the god's image, then offer it food and drink. So let's watch another brief video clip about these rituals. On special festival days, the cult statue would be carried from the temple to a boat on the Nile, carried to another ritual site, and then brought back. Let's watch one last video clip about the pharaoh's role in this important ceremony. So now we move on to the second kind of temple, a mortuary temple honoring a pharaoh. And here again is the dynamic duo on site. This was no ordinary pharaoh. Let's turn to a clip from another also very good video and learn a little more about Queen Hatshepsut. The statue on the left is one of your required images. I added the Sphinx because I think it's cool. Both are in the Metropol Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and both were painstakingly restored from fragments. 
Let's watch the video and find out why they were in fragments. I'm not going to say a lot more about the temple. You just saw it on the, on the video, but here are a few vocabulary words you might need to know. I haven't seen these terms on an AP exam yet, but you never know. The, this plan is not a required image. In fact, the plan of the temple is not a required image, but I included the labeled plan in your workbook. Note that the temple includes shrines to gods other than the pharaoh. Also notice the two long causeways leading up to the chamfered pillars, past the colonnades, and beyond them to the hypostyle hall. I mentioned that the Met reconstructed these statues from fragments. Hatshepsut's stepson, Tutmos III, had all of the statues the female pharaoh destroyed. Why was that such a violent and shocking act? Let's watch one last video clip. Remember that the pharaoh's ka actually lived in these statues. Destroy the statues, destroy the ka, and Hatshepsut's chances in the afterlife. And alas, that is all the time we have for this fascinating pharaoh. The next pharaoh will be even stranger. Stay 